All right. A new week has come, and once again, we are all back here for a seminar. Today, our speaker is from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. It is Gabriel Patino. Yeah, thank you. That was very nice. So, uh, thanks everyone for uh, uh, coming or attending the seminar. I will talk about a problem that I have talked about before, so some of you might have seen this talk. It is about, or, or not, well, not the entirety of the talk, but some half of it. I, I, apparently, I, I spoke about it in, in Boston a couple of years ago. So um, this will be about state transfer and the size of the graph. And it kind of uh, builds a little bit on, on this problem of trying to optimize uh, the graph in the sense of getting the smallest possible or, or cheapest possible graph you could build that it still achieves this uh, state transfer at large distances. So, uh, but before actually talking about well, quantum walks or, or the main problem, I'll try to introduce or motivate uh, this problem a little bit, talking about quantum, talking about walks in graphs. So I understand some people here might not have uh, seen quantum walks before. So try to, to follow a little bit now and um, see if you can get um, the analogy. So a walk in a graph usually refers to this process in which you have a location at the start and, and this is the graph I'm choosing, these eight vertices. And, and I, I am denoting this location at the start using probability. So I'll be saying that I have probability one of being black here, zero of being white. And then in the other verses, it's probably one of being white, zero of being black. So you can think of your walker as this uh, probability density in your graph, the probability of being black. So it's one here, zero everywhere else. So everything sums to one and we are fine. And then there is a transition rule, uh, which uh, in this case will be helping to a neighbor or staying put with equal probability. So, uh, which I'm calling the one fourth rule. So this is what happens in the first step, right? So now I have probability one fourth of being all these guys, zero still zero here. And then next step, now I have this sort of like diffusion process, next step. I eventually, and, and if you actually I think there might be something wrong here. I think these are supposed to be five over 32, but anyway, eventually, well, if you have studied anything about uh, um, this uh, uh, random walks in the graph, you know that, well, with this transition rule that I'm stipulating here, this will uh, uh, evolve to a sort of like a, a constant probability everywhere, okay? Now, how do we uh, model this phenomena using well, matrices, so we do have a matrix, which is here basically the adjacent matrix of this graph, plus a diagonal of ones, and multiplying everything by one fourth. So that's basically saying that I have this one fourth probability of moving or staying. And this is the vector that denotes my initial state, which is probability one of being here, zero everywhere else. And this is what I obtain. This matrix multiplication kind of represents what happens after the first step. And then if you want to see what happens here, now you get this vector and you multiply your matrix by it, and then you get what happens uh, here, and then so on. If you keep multiplying your matrix, you will end up seeing uh, um, this state at any given point, OK? Now, why did I choose this example? Because it not only displays this sort of like walk with the steps and the transition rule and the initial uh, state, but also it displays a very nice phenomena, which is this uh, equitable partition. So look what happens here. The, um, 
I have this uh, black vertex, which is where I started, and then its neighbors, the yellow, and then the neighbors of the yellow, which are the, the blues, and then the the neighbors of the blues, which are going further, which is which is the red. And this, I, I redraw this graph here because here it's very clear what's happening. The number of edges that go from a, ver a yellow vertex to a blue vertex is the same no matter which yellow vertex you pick. Two edges go to the right. And, and the number of edges that go from a yellow vertex to the black is the same as one vertex, one edge. And, and the same for all the classes. You, no matter which, which vertex you pick, the number of edges that go either to its left or to its right depends only on its color, which we can represent by drawing this sort of weighted directed path, saying that three edges go from each black to the yellows, two edges go from each yellow to the blues and so on. And interestingly, this partition that I, that I, that I put here, it actually corresponds to the fact that the probabilities will be constant in each of these color classes. So uh, here I have one zeros everywhere. Now, when I got one fourth here, I also got one fourth in the other yellows. When I got one eighth here, I also got one eighth in the other blues. And when I got three, so you see there is a, uh, it's constant in the scholar classes, okay? And this is gonna be key to the rest of the talk. Eventually I will talk about quantum alts, but I will still make use of this actual partition and the fact that the sort of probability or, or densities in, in each of these classes will be constant as long as you have this sort of actual partition with this uh, irregularity property. Now the actual partition is very convenient because it allows you to actually compute the state of this process using a smaller matrix. So here uh, I will be denoting uh, the initial state as one zero zero zero, meaning that I have probability one of being black, zero of being at all yellow versus zero of being at the blues and, and reds, okay. And then the matrix that I use to actually multiply and see what's happening is this matrix, which is the adjacency matrix of this weighted path. Again, with the uh, diagonals of ones, just because I had the rule of, of staying at, of being able to stay at where I was, okay? And this is actually what's happening. You multiply your matrix by one, zero, zero, that's what you get. You multiply a matrix by this vector, that's the new state here. Uh, this says that you have probability three eighths of being at a yellow vertex, which corresponds to summing these three things. And then you multiply again and so on. So this is all fine. And this displays this very nice uh, uh, idea of reducing your walk in a larger graph to a walk in a smaller graph that still conveys everything that you would, you would know looking at the bigger graph. And this would be very key, very important to what we're going to discuss now, which is uh, uh, quantum mode. Okay. Now, for whoever already knows what a quantum walk is, this uh, slide is going to be a bit repetitive. But I suppose some of you might not have seen this or might not remember well. So, um, what is a quantum walk in a graph? Each vertex corresponds to a qubit. A qubit is the um, is the quantum unit of information in a sense. So, the same way that a bit uh, as you can think of a bit as a mathematical object, the set with two elements, zero or one, which could be in a state either zero or one. So you select one of the two elements here and you call that the state of your bit. The qubit, you, you, the, the, the generalization here is instead of two elements, you have two dimensions. So you have a, a complex uh, a vector space of dimension two and your state, instead of being one element, is going to be a one-dimensional subspace. Okay, so this is the sort of like mathematical analogy. And, and, and physically, well, a bit, you can think of a bit as a, a transistor either on or off. A qubit would be, a, a let's say, an electron spinning in a certain direction. Um, you could think of it like that. And then, and then, of course, comes the question, how do you represent the subspace well, you choose a representative vector and then the things make a lot of sense and mathematically will work if you choose unit vectors. 
uh, to represent your subspace. So you could have the subspace spent by this guy or the subspace spent by this guy or very generally the subspace spent by this um, alpha beta. Well, and if you assume they are, this is a unit vector, alpha and beta must satisfy this equation. So we're talking about a quantum walk in a graph. So what is the location at the start? So the location at the start is a state. And typically for the purposes of this talk, the state is always going to be uh, the qubit at this vertex at one state, let's say one zero, and the qubits at all other vertices at the orthogonal state, which is a state zero one, okay? And this state here, which is special in this vertex and, and, and orthogonal in all other vertices can be encoded as this vector. Um, there is a sort of like, math, this is not something that I'm, I'm making up. You can actually very make this very formal and understand how this is actually encoding. But for the purposes of this talk, just believe me, this is a well justified mathematical uh, operation. This, this encoding is, is, is legit. And you can encode this state as one zero zero zero, meaning that this state one zero is at the first vertex with probability one and is at the other verses with probability zero. Oops. Now, the transition rule. The transition rule is determined by two things, a Hamiltonian and Schrodinger's equation. Now, Hamiltonian is a force, is, is the force that governs the interactions in the graph. And when I choose, when, when I think of a graph, it's very natural to think that the Hamiltonian is going to be the adjacency matrix, meaning that this edge will represent interaction between the particles which sit here and here. And the fact that there is no edge here means that these two things do not interact. And this interaction, of course, is, is physically explained. We don't need to get into the details, but the Hamiltonian is a matrix. And, and actually, uh, if you have studied some more sophisticated classical physics, this is, this is, uh, you can basically explain all, well, even classical physics forces and all with Hamiltonians. This is the language of Hamiltonians is very powerful. And, and for quantum things, you do get your Hamiltonian. And then what tells you how the thing's going to transition or evolve is Schrodinger's equation. So if this is constant and you let it run, this matrix will pretty much describe the state of the graph at time t. So uh, this is the exponential, so the of ITA, this is well defined in terms of a power series that you apply to this matrix multiplied by the imaginary constant i or time t, which is a real positive number. And this is, uh, for this particular graph, you can actually carry out the computations explicitly. This is what you get. Uh, just to be clear, this is the example at time t equals pi on two. You come here, you put t equals pi on two, you substitute in all these cosines and sines. Uh, this is supposed to be pi on two, sorry. And then this is what you get. This is going to be the matrix you get. Uh, only the signs are going to survive, the cosines are going to kill everything. You're going to get these minus ones. And this was my original state. This is what will, the state I will be at time pi on two, meaning that I will observe one zero at the last vertex with probability. And then here, uh, the fact that this is a minus one doesn't really matter. The quantum axioms will tell you that the only thing that matters in terms of the observation is its absolute value squared. So it's the probability absolute value squared of minus one, which is one. So my walker started here and after time pi on two ended up here. And then of course, this is a going procedure that I have this, uh, of course, many of you have already seen this movie before. I have this uh, sort of animation. So here, I have uh, what would the quantum walk look like in this graph. Um, this is the, the exponential of ITA. I'm putting the absolute values of each entry. Otherwise, I would have a bunch of uh, complex numbers and i's here and you wouldn't understand anything. So here I'm already putting the absolute values. And then if you let your quantum walk run, that's what it looks like. Okay. So this kind of already tells you or, or displays this very nice difference between a quantum walk and a random walk, because a random walk uh, will most likely have this sort of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, it will spread out and tend to be constant after a while. The quantum walk, on the other hand, has this sort of oscillating behavior. If I had let it run past this time pi on two, we would actually see it going back to the left, and then it would be moving right and left, right and left. And the fact that we started here and then ended up here is the main phenomenon we will discuss in this talk, which is perfect state transfer. We started here with probability one, and then we end up here with probability one, meaning that the state was perfectly transferred from here to here. And this is not the usual in most graphs. If we had just simply generated a random graph and started a quantum walk anywhere, most likely we would not see the sort of uh, 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 this sort of uh, uh, phenomenon. We, actually, we would see uh, quantum walk getting uh, uh, more and more uh, sort of like unpredictable in a sense. It would be uh, difficult to see a pattern, even though it is an almost periodic, if you know what that means, an almost periodic procedure. It tends not to be straight, straight periodic as we had just seen here, because it would be moving from left to right and then back. Now, so what is our problem or the problem that I want to use to motivate this talk? I imagine that I have this big graph here with way more verses and edges than you see. And then I have this uh, special black vertex, which will be my initial vertex, and this red vertex, which is my target vertex. And I want to, I want to have perfect state transfer from here to here. Um, and, and then, of course, this is a complicated network with a bunch of other vertices. But here, just picture that this is, let's say, the shortest path between black and white. Uh, and, and then, of course, the number of edges here uh, corresponds to this thing, which is a combinatorial distance of two verses in a graph. Mind you, this is not, if this graph is actually representing a physical system, there is a physical distance, which is exactly the distance you would measure. But there is this combinatorial distance, which is the number of vertices that sit between the two guys in, in, in their shortest path in the graph, which might not correspond at all to the physical distance. Even if these are edges of unit length, the fact that they're not lined up in a straight uh, uh, line between red and blank means that this combinatorial distance and the physical distance may not be the same. However, there is a very nice sense in which the combinatorial distance is also important for practical I suppose, you, what did you guys miss? Just the last sentence or so? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So, yeah, we're back here. Uh, how large must the graph be compared to this? So that's the picture. Uh, so what would be the candidates that you would think of? The candidates would be the paths, okay? So you look at this path from black to red. We actually do get perfect state transfer time pi on two. Look at the path on three verses. We actually do get perfect state transfer at time pi over square root of two. And then, of course, if you're just trying to be funny, you would expect or hope that there is perfect state transfer in this path on, on four verses at time pi over cube root of two. I mean, see the pattern. This would be very fun, but that's actually false. That doesn't happen. Uh, no path on more than three verses admits perfect state transfer. So there is something very special about P2 and P3 that does not happen in P4 and no other longer path. So, of course, my problem here would be trivially uh, uh, um, trivially answered if this was actually an infinite family of paths admitting PST. But the fact that they do not means that this problem actually starts making sense now because the shortest possible graph doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, and this has been known for shit, 15 years now. Wow. Um, Gabriel. Uh, yes. There is a question in the chat. Brendan Rooney asks, what do you mean by large? Number of vertices and edges compared to the combinatorial distance. Number of vertices and edges. Or edges. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. We actually see both, both things uh, being uh, relevant. So either the number of vertices or edges that you need to have in the rest of your network. Okay, so, so path would be the smallest possible. The path would be the smallest possible because you have distance t and you have the smallest possible number or necessary to have this uh, path of distance d, which is uh, 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 d plus one versus any d edges. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, and and which are the, the, the so th this would be the good candidates. Which are the bad candidates that actually work? So if you have your path on two vertices, and and then there is this very nice thing. You take its Cartesian square. So this is a graph operation. Uh, fortunately, if you take the Cartesian square, and this was the the trans the matrix that represents the transition of your quantum wall. The matrix that represents the transition of the quantum wall here is the tensor product of this matrix with itself. So at time pi on two, this was the matrix. Okay, if you put pi on two here, A is the adjacent matrix of this guy. This is the matrix you get, which represents that perfect state transfer. And then if you take its uh, tensor product with itself, this is the matrix that you get. And again, this octagonal entry of absolute value equal to one means that there is perfect state transfer in this guy between black and red. Actually, there is perfect state transfer in this guy between from, from black to red, from red to black, and also from this white to this white and from this white. And then it's not very difficult now for you to, to, to realize that if this procedure is iterated, you actually do get an infinite family of graphs admitting perfect state transfer at increasingly large distances as the Cartesian product of this guy with P2 is the three-dimensional cube. The matrix will be this one, uh, tensor three times. If you tensor this matrix with this matrix, you will get a matrix with an off diagonal entry of absolute value equals to one. So meaning that there is perfect state transfer in this graph between black and red, and also between this white and this white. The antipodal pairs all here admit perfect state transfer. If you start at any one, after time pi on two, you will be at its antipodal pair. Um, and then of course you can repeat this procedure. So you have a d-dimensional hypercube. This is the transition matrix. At time pi on two, you get perfect state transfer. The distance is D. So you see one, two, three. The distance between black and red is the dimension of your hypercube. However, the number of vertices is exponential. It's two to the D vertices. The number of edges is, is D times two to the D minus one. So the number of vertices of course, if the number of verses is, is exponential and the graph is connected, the number of edges is also going to be exponential, and that's actually what you get. Okay, so we are we can construct families of graphs with PST at increasing large distances. However, it seems to be expensive. If you think that this, okay, you think now the news that you read that IBM had just invented its quantum computer with I don't know 53 qubits. Very soon, this number will surpass 53. Okay, so it's not that this is a procedure that seems to be uh, efficient or cheap. Okay, so this is the problem. Either find lower bound on the size of the graph or improve on these examples. I mean, find better examples or show that the, the thing that was not happening with the paths actually is part of a, of a bigger thing that doesn't, have, ha doesn't happen with graphs with few edges and, 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 and vertices. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the lower bound. So this is the equation that defines perfect state transfer. And I have put here the, the definition and here the example. Okay, so you want to put the exponential of ITA is the adjacent matrix of this guy. You see it here. This is the original, the, the state 100, zero, zero, meaning that you're starting here. And this is what you want. You want to end up here, which means 001. Zero, zero, and, and, and remember that example that I had a minus one. Well, this is basically this lambda here, which can be any complex number of absolute value one. So it could be a minus one here, it could be i, it could be whatever you want. The only thing that truly matters is this is uh, uh, zeros in the other verses and this is zeros in the other verses. So what do you do when you look at a question like this? Well, the two at hand, which is the most efficient thing you can use here is the spectral decomposition. This is a symmetric matrix. This is a function applied at a symmetric matrix. A function actually means you're applying the function at the eigenvalues. The projectors remain uh, put. So what happens here is you replace this exponential of ITA by its uh, spectral decomposition. So this is the exponential of IT eigenvalue multiplied by the same projector that you had in your matrix A. And then because this is a symmetric matrix, these projectors are diagonalizing the matrix, the sum of these projectors is equal to the, the identity matrix. So the, the hidden identity matrix that sits here, I'm replacing by this sum. And now you multiply both sides by uh, 
any given projector that you want, you need these equalities to be true. Actually, this is an if and only if, because these are all orthogonal uh, projectors. So you get a sum of orthogonal vectors is equal to a sum of orthogonal vectors. You must have uh, uh, the pairs on each side equal. So that's basically what's happening here. Now, if you look at this example, uh, this, this matrix has three eigenvalues, square root of two, zero, and minus square root of two. These matrices you see here are the projectors. Okay, I'm already displaying the three equations that you get here if you look at each eigenvalue separately. And you need this, you need to find a time t that makes this two, and, and, and a value for lambda that makes these two sides equal simultaneously. So this is the uh, system of, let's say, equations you must solve to decide whether or not there is a state transfer in your graph. Okay, now, uh, this equation here is basically equivalent to two things. First, this is a complex number of unit value. This is a complex number of, of unit uh, uh, absolute value. So, and this is a real vector. This is a real vector. So these two real vectors must be plus or minus each other. And once they are either plus or minus, for each R will depend, for some R will be a plus, for another R will be a minus then you need the, this uh, e to the i t theta r to value its sign accordingly to lambda, okay? Um, so let's first see if this is actually uh, true in this example, it is. I'm looking at each projector and I'm looking at the column corresponding to A, the column corresponding to B, they are plus or minus each other, good. Not only that, but now I need to check that e to the i t square root of two lambda, the, the, the plus or minus pattern corresponds to the plus or minus pattern that we see here. So this is equal, so I need this guy to be equal to this. There's a minus each, each other, so I need this guy to be minus lambda. These are equal, so I need this guy here to be minus lambda. And fortunately, there is a choice of lambda and t that make this work, which is t equal pi over square root of two, lambda equals minus one. Okay meaning we have perfect state transfer in this graph. Um, and, and this is basically the sort of computations you, you will basically do every time you wanna check whether or not there is perfect state transfer in this graph. This is the standard way of doing things. Now, um, Chris showed back in 2011 that uh, if, if this condition here for all R, whenever this projector is different than zero, you get the z to the i t theta r very sign. This, this imposes very strong restrictions on what kind of numbers the eigenvalues could be. Chris showed that if this is true, then the eigenvalues are either all integers or quadratic integers in the same field extension. Meaning, uh, if, if let's say, the zero is, is, I don't know, 15 times square root of three, the other ones have to be something times square root of three. You cannot have, have now square root of seven. Um, so they are either all integers or quadratic integers in the same field extension. And from this, we observe a very nice consequence, which are whenever the projector, the, these projections are different than zero, the eigenvalues are spaced by at least one unit, which tends not to be the case for most graphs you end up thinking. Um, uh, not most graphs, but most graphs that end up thinking. For example, the cycle uh, on, I don't know, 20 verses, all its eigenvalues lie between minus two and two. It has 20 eigenvalues squeezing in there, so they're definitely not spaced by at least one. Now, so you do need eigenvalues to be spaced by at least one. And now this, is, this actually allows us to derive a very nice combinatorial sort of argument uh, that will uh, lower bound the size of the graph. So think now on the walk module of a vertex, meaning you start with its characteristic vector, you apply the matrix A, you apply A squared, A cubed, and so on. Eventually you apply A raise the radius of the vertex, meaning that here, and up until you got up to here, you're still reaching further and further in the graph. From here on, uh, you are no longer reaching new vertices in your graph, but 
what happens is from here all the way up to here, because the support of your walker is increasing, you do get linearly independent vectors. And from here on, you might still get some linearly independent vectors, but you don't know. But all the way up to here, you're getting linearly independent vectors. Uh, and, and then, well, this piece of ours, which are the projectors, are powers in A, and each one of these A's are linear combinations of these guys. So the span of these vectors is the same thing as the span of these vectors. Meaning now that you have R plus one linearly independent vectors here. So you could have more linearly independent vectors, but you have at least R plus one. So R plus one is at most the number of indices so that this is different than zero because these guys are all orthogonal. So whenever they're different than zero, you get something linearly independent and they form a basis for this walk module. So R plus one is at most the number of R so that these things are different than zero. And now come back here, these eigenvalues are spaced by at least one. So the numbers of things which are different than zero is upper bounded by the size of the interval. All eigenvalues lie between theta zero and minus theta zero. So the size of this interval is two theta zero plus one. You have at most two theta zero plus one integers or, or point space by, by things of unit length between these two things. So you do get that the radius of the vertex plus one is upper bounded by two times the largest eigenvalue plus one. And then, of course, you all know the sum of the eigenvalue squared is two times, the num two times the number of edges because this is the trace of a squared. So now we do get, and, and then of course you can forget about all of them and simply look at theta, theta zero here. So you do get now that the radius is upper bounded by the number of edges and there's a square here. So we have moved from the linear trivial thing that the radius of any vertex is upper bounded by the number of edges. Of course, you need a bunch of edges to get to the radius. Now we get something squared. So the radius squared in a sense will be upper bounded by the number of edges. Okay. Actually, you can do a little bit better. Instead of, you can fidget a little bit. Instead of using the largest, you can pick the eigenvalue in the middle, do some nice calculation. And actually, you can, instead of squared, you can actually get to cube, cubic. So this is the result. So you get the radius of the vertex involved in perfect state transfer over three cubed is upper bounded by two times the number of edges. And then, of course, the radius of any vertex upper bounds the diameter of the graph over two. So you can actually get this uh, very general uh, global bound that must happen in a graph that admits perfect state transfer. The diameter cubed over diameter over six cubed must be smaller or equal than two times the number of edges. So if you simply think of a path on, I don't know, um, 18 vertices, the diameter is 18, this is three so cubed, 27, number of edges is, um, we are still in there, but, but you can very easily see that this will rule out a bunch of paths. Uh, actually, if you were using the radius, then it would be even more, even stronger, right? Um, actually, in a, you know, Skype, in a Skype meeting last week, we were just discussing this thing and, and uh, we were realizing that uh, there, are, there are some results about the expected diameter of the random tree, and they seem to be uh, the diameter wants to be larger than this compared to the number of edges. So we still haven't actually uh, checked the details, but apparently this would work to show that most trees do not admit perfect state transfer. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that's it. So we, we were suspecting that it could be uh, the paths would work, they don't work. In the past, you have this linear relation between diameter and size of the graph. This is actually saying that you must have this uh, sort of polynomial thing at least. So this, this is actually, as far as I know, the best known lower bound that uses only the diameter and the number of edges. There are some uh, other known lower bounds using 
uh, the eigenvalues and the sum of the degrees, but they're not so uh, um, they're not so informative as this one is. Um, now let's now look at the best known example. So uh, this is actually uh, some something which some, something very nice has appeared last year or two years ago. Um, so th these are the hypercubes, okay? The P2, P2 Cartesian square, P P2 Cartesian cube. This is the uh, weighted path corresponding to this thing using that Ecto partition that we discussed in the beginning of the talk. So see again, I'm replacing the two yellow vertices by one yellow vertex. I'm counting the number of edges that go from each class to the, to the next. These are the adjacency matrices of this weighted path, okay? Now, a uh, very nice thing about the quantum walk uh, on these graphs here and the quantum walk on this sort of Cauchian weighted paths is that they do relate very nicely. This similarly, as we saw in the beginning with the classical random walk, and actually uh, I, I explained here very briefly why. So if A is the adjacency matrix of this guy, and B is the adjacency matrix of this guy, and P is the partition matrix that tells you basically that you have four classes, black, yellow, blue, and red, four classes, and tells you which vertex belongs to each class. Now, uh, the fact that this is an actual partition, that these numbers are all regular counting the number of edges going back and forth, means that if you multiply A by P, this is exactly equal to P times B. Okay, so this is actually, could me as well say that this is the definition of a partition being equitable. And now if you apply a function at A, it's the same thing that the P's will start moving at the powers of A to the left, to the left, to the left. Eventually you're gonna get the same function applied at B. So this is the sort of uh, consequence that you get from this equation, you get this equation. Meaning, now it's not very hard for you to, to check that if there is PST on this matrix, you get PST on this matrix because black and, and, and red are vectors that are the only ones in your corresponding part. Uh, you can check that if you want. Now, um, this thing here at the bottom is just a comment, a side comment that I want to make uh, clear that at first, if you look at this thing here, this is not a symmetric matrix. So the physicist will tell you that you cannot really run a, rent, a quantum walk here in this graph because your Hamiltonian must be or a Hermitian matrix. And this is not. However, there is a procedure called symmetrization via diagonal similarity, which means that this matrix uh, is similar to this one. And the matrix that you use to realize the similarity is a diagonal matrix, starts with a one, ends with a one. Similarly for this one, you can actually compute these diagonal matrices explicitly. So you have that D, B, D minus one is actually B prime, this matrix, okay? And now this matrix is Hermitian. You can uh, physically speak about a, a quantum walk here. And then uh, again, this diagonal similarity behaves quite nicely within the, ex the exponential. The D, D minus one will cancel. You're gonna have a D going to the left, a D minus one going to the right. And then actually PST, uh, uh, let's say formal PST in this matrix, which is not a quantum system, implies a, a real quantum physical PST in this graph, okay? So this sort of like symmetrized weighted path is the physical thing that would actually have PST, but this is more like a sort of like side comment for, for whoever is more interested in the uh, physical realization of, of state transfer. Mathematically, there is nothing wrong saying that this matrix has PST, as long as you 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 understand what you're talking about. Okay, so again, uh, the fact that I move from here to here means that I move from here to here and at the same time. Now let's look at so this is the uh, uh, hypercube dimension one, two, three, dimension four here now. So this is what the hypercube dimension four looks like. This is the weighted path that corresponds to this thing. Of course, you, had, you have already realized the pattern, four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. Things are working nicely. You also, I'm pretty sure all of you know how to compute how many verses there are in each one of these classes. This is the symmetrized 
uh, uh, adjacency matrix of this weighted path. This is the graph that would correspond to it. And now I will do this. This is the crucial maybe moment of this whole explanation, perhaps new to, to some of you. I will replace these four verses in the middle by this blue vertex. But, but I, I've made it larger because I want to think that this blue, big blue vertex, this is now no longer a unweighted graph. This is a weighted graph, weights in the vertices. And this big blue vertex here has weight too. And my understanding now when counting the number of edges going to the right or to the left is that I will take into account the weights of the vertices. So because this is an edge going from a vertex of weight one to a vertex of weight two, I would think as it as two, two edges. So two, uh, uh, the weight of this vertex divided by the weight of this vertex. So the weight of the target divided by the weight of the, of the initial vertex. So this edge here has sort of like, you think of it as two edges. So I still have three edges going from each yellow vertex to the blue vertices. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three and so on. Also, I still have two edges going from each blue vertex to a green vertex. If I look at this guy, I have one, I have one, I have two in total. Now, from this guy, you would say that I actually have four, but remember, this edge now has weight one divided by two. So from this big blue vertex, I do have two edges actually going to the greens. A half plus a half plus a half plus a half. Okay. Which means that if you write the adjacency matrix of this graph, putting these weights in the edges, this is still an actual partition of the vertices with this weighted path corresponding to the weights going to the right or to the left. Okay. And now I forget about the weight in the middle, which means I get the weighted adjacency matrix of this guy and I multiply by a diagonal matrix on the left and on the right that cancels the weight of the vertex in the middle. So this is no longer an actual partition because there are no more weights. However, it is related to this graph, which has this actual partition via multiplication by a diagonal matrix and its inverse. Okay. Now I do have PST here in this graph from black to red, which means I do get PST here from black to red. Now this graph has the same, has an actual partition and its quotient graph is this one. So PST here from black to red means that I get PST on this graph from black to red. And now because this one has been obtained from this one via this diagonal similarity which only changes the vertex in the middle and does nothing to the black and red, I still get PST here on this graph from, the, from black to red. So I start from the hypercube, I look at its quotient, I find a weighted graph with the same quotient, and now I realize that removing the weight does not interfere with PST from black to red. So PST on this graph means that I get PST on this graph. Okay, now uh, this sort of like uh, uh, weighted actual partition uh, or unweighted graph that admits an actual partition as long as you weight it is a trick that I, I learned reading this paper from 1996 from Fjall, Garig, and Yebra. They, of course, are not talking about quantum things. And then I, I realized that this trick could be used to. To, to get this sort of like smaller graph admitting PST from black to red, uh, which relates very much with the hypercube. And then of course, I mean, you kind of see that here, 
the graph is sort of like getting bigger and you're using a bunch of vertices. And then you would like to believe that by doing this thing here, you would, you're actually uh, uh, on the track of, of, of improving a lot the number of vertices, okay? So I realized this trick and uh, discussed this a little bit with uh, Alistair Kay and he, but, but I couldn't see how to make this much better. I mean, I could see if you give me a hypercube, uh, six, seven, eight dimensional hypercube, you can sort of like, so, ad hoc ways, find, find ways of actually performing this trick, but it's not something you actually do generalize very nicely because see, the, the counting the number of edges must actually match a very strict pattern, okay? And then, so Alistair actually did realize, or, or he squeezed it even further. I mean, he found ways of, of making this a, a little bit more uh, automatic. So this is the four dimensional hypercube, as we saw. Uh, I'll be using all this thing to denote one vertex, four vertices, six vertices, four vertices, one vertex. And this is what we did. So actually in, in this class with six vertices, we changed four of them to one and we didn't change the other two. And then very easily you realize that if you actually look at a class and you try to make some verses in the class special, things get quite hairy. I mean, the, the numbers do not really match. Now it would be much better if you could instead reduce an entire class of vertices in a uniform way. So he realized that in the six dimensional hypercube, the 20 vertices in the middle class, each group of five, four vertices could be uh, blocked into one vertex. So instead of having 20, you now have five in the middle. And the counts and the numbers of edges still change, but except that now, instead of having three edges going, four edges coming in, you have the double going because now these edges have half the weight and half coming because these edges now have double the weight. Uh, so this is sort of like uh, what you could do with the six dimensional hypercube. You get to the 20 verses in the middle, you group each four of them into a bigger vertex and then later you forget about the weight, but PST still happens as we saw in the previous slide. And, and he, he, he tells us that the, the best he could find was actually the six dimensional hypercube which by performing this trick in some places, he could reduce from two to the 16 verses to two to the 13, which of course is still exponential in 16, which is the distance. I mean, we are talking about distance 16 and we are needing two to the 16 verses instead two to the 13 verses still, I mean, we improved a lot, but we're still quite far from a cubic function on 16, okay? And, and this all appears in this very nice paper, the PSD graph limbo is actually, so the best construction in this paper actually comes from P3 and its Cartesian powers. So this is P3. Again, I want PSD from zero to two. This is P3 squared. And, and then we do have this actual partition. The colors are the classes of the actual partition. As you can see, you have two edges going from black, from each black vertex to the yellows. You have one edge going from each yellow to the gray. You have one edge going to each, uh, from each yellow to the blue and, and so on. You can realize that the color classes here form an actual partition. The number of edges moving from color to color does not depend on the vertex you pick in each color class. This is actually the Cauchy graph of this one. You have the yellow, the blue, the green, the gray, the red. You can think of these verses as being uh, encoded by zero, one, and two. Uh, the color classes are determined by the number of zeros and the number of twos. Uh, uh, as you move up, you have fewer zeros, and as you move to the right, you have more twos. So here you, here you have two zeros, zero, zero, and, 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 and no twos. Here you have one zero and one, one. Here you have one zero and one two. So you've got more twos, you're getting fewer zeros. Here you have no twos and no zeros, it's one one. Here you have two and one, here you have two two. So the sort of like very nice drawing of, of and, and way of understanding. And here's a table actually counting the number of zeros and, and twos in each of the color classes, okay? So this is, uh, so this is distance four, okay? One, two, three, four between black and red. So this is what 
this is what the sort of like diagram would look like for the distance 10. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, distance 10 between black and red. These numbers in the middle tell you, tell, will tell you how many verses are, are in each one of these things. So yellow here has two verses. Now here, instead of two, I have five verses. Uh, and, and these numbers over the edges are telling you how many edges are going from each one of these guys to each one, to, to, to this entire thing here. So here, from yellow to blue, I have only one edge. So the number here would be a one. From, from, from gray to green, I have two edges. So the number here would be a two. So this is sort of like the picture you get. And then Alastair noted that you have these blobs with 20 verses and to each one of them, you could again reduce uh, each block of force to, to a single bigger vertex. So instead of uh, looking uh, again, where are you? Oops, oops. Instead of 20 verses here, here, and here, you could have five verses here, here, and here. So the game is to actually wonder whether or not the number of verses in each one of these this, this classes is a multiple of four. Because when they are, you can group vertices each, each four vertices into one big fat vertex. Now it's a trivial exercise to count that the number of vertices here is basically uh, the factorial divided by the number of zeros, the number of ones, and number of twos. We want this to be a multiple of four. Alastair noted that if you choose D, the distance to be a power of two, uh, and here's the picture that actually, of course, I didn't draw this, I, I hid it, I, I got this from his paper. Uh, so this is what the graph for distance 32 would look like. So you, this is the, the, the black vertex, this is the red vertex. Uh, this is a sort of like P3 Cartesian itself, 16 times, so that you get distance 32. And then he realized that a bunch of this a bunch of these blobs have size divisible by four. So this is the picture already after dividing all of those that had size divisible by four by four. So this graph has 680,000 verses as opposed to the original 43 million, which seems to be quite an improvement, except that we are in the realm of exponential numbers. So unfortunately, even though this seems quite a big improvement, this is still small compared to the original size, which was uh, with, with, with the fact that we are dealing with exponents. I mean, 32 is the distance. We would like the size of the graph to be a cubic in 32, but we are actually talking about 680,000 verses, which is quite far from a cubic in 32, okay? So he actually discusses that the, the limit of this construction is still lower bounded by an exponential growth. So for hypercubes, the number of verses is two to the d, this is the distance. For powers of P3, the number of verses is two to this uh, 0.792d. Actually, if you, do, if you put D equals 32 here, that's basically the number you get. Uh, it's not exact, so you get something very close to 40, 43 million. And the limit of this method by taking D to the powers of two to this, uh, and dividing blocks by four actually gets you, the best possible you could get is, is this, which is still again an exponential. So two to the 0 0.584. So he calls this a sort of like efficient, efficiency constant of your PST graph or whatever, uh, which unfortunately is still exponential. I mean, it's much better, but still, we are still, uh, that this is, and this is by far the best known example. Uh, th this is the best known example of a graph with PST between two verses at, at, at such large distance and, and, and the fewer possible number of verses. So of course, no one ever expects to, com com to build a quantum computer with 600,000 qubits. So it's not really going to work quite well. So is there some hope? And, and this is a very nice example that we learned from Dragan Stevanovich uh, two years ago. Uh, look at this graph. This is no longer a weighted path from, uh, well, this is a weighted path, but no longer, the verses that would have PST are no longer one extreme to the other. They're actually the second in the weighted path. Uh, so the distance between black 
and right here is 7. And you can very easily compute that if the distance is d, the number of vertices is a quadratic function, and the number of edges is a cubic function. Uh, the pattern is this. You have 1, skip, 2, skip, 3, skip, 4, skip, 5. And then here I have 1, skip, 2, skip, 3, skip, 4, skip, 5. And you have complete bipartite graphs between each of these classes. And with this rule, you can compute the number of verses and edges proportional to the distance between black and red. This is, a, uh, this is an actual partition. Here is the weighted path that corresponds to it. You have all these classes. You have the number of edges is constant from each vertex here to the next. The eigenvalues of this weighted path are 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. If by any chance, miracle, weirdness, zero well, was an eigenvalue also, I mean, there is a zero missing here. If, by, if zero were an eigenvalue here, there would be PST between black and red. So there is something very weird that tells you that this graph almost got PSD. And it would be an example with the quadratic number of versus cubic number of edges, basically best possible. As, as we know, cubic is a lower bound. So this would be best possible. But unfortunately, zero is not an eigenvalue here. And then I tried, and Alistar tells in his paper that he also tried to tweak this construction, sort of use the same spirit, I mean, sort of this bipartite thing here, moving left or right or whatever. And, but we can't seem to be able to actually find it. So um, here is probably the easiest and most interesting problem of today's talk. I mean, look at this graph. What would you do here to make the eigenvalues exactly like this, but with an extra zero? Uh, and, 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 then, and then in the weighted pass, sort of weighted pass construction. So you can't simply put two verses here and, and now tell me that there is a zero eigenvalue. You must have still the weighted path sort of actual partition. Uh, that's it. So that's the question. Is there a family of graphs with PST at increasing large distances and sizes of the graphs bounded above by a polynomial function? Or is there an exponential function on the distances that bounds the size of the graphs from below? What is the best you can do? And with that, I finish. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, so I already have one question for you in the chat. Um, uh, asks, stop sharing my screen. how did you find this? Um, how did you find this graph, the last one? Uh, I, uh, ba -ba -ba. This, uh, this last one that I showed is... Uh, can you keep scaring, uh, sharing your screen? Yeah, I think I can. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, this one, okay. Um, this graph, right? Uh, I didn't. Dragon Stavanovich did. But he didn't find this graph. Uh, with the intent of actually doing quantum walks. I have I actually, I don't remember anymore. Uh, he, he knew of this graph and then he saw us discussing this sort of uh, PSD stuff. And then he said, wait a second, I do have a graph, a weighted graph with an actual partition, which is a weighted path. The eigenvalues are integers. Are you guys any interested? And then we looked at the eigenvalues and we we're like, these are promising eigenvalues, and, but then we realized that zero was missing. So it was a sort of, so, so this was all in 2018, the workshop in Waterloo. We had some people talking about quantum stuff, some people talking about the regular theory, Drake was there. This was a problem Alistair and I were discussing. He saw us discussing, he showed us this example, uh, basically saying, hey, I know of this grant for other reasons. Is it of any interest to you guys? And, and then it was almost, uh, of interest to us. Well, I mean, it, it is interesting. I mean, it, it kind of gives us hope. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else have questions for Gabriel? All 
right. Um, if not, let's thank him again. Uh, thank you all.